I remember you asked for specifically what's the failure story. And I was like, well, pretty much most, most of my career <laughs> living in a state of low self-awareness, low self-expectation, low ambition. Welcome to Beyond the Fail, the podcast where we talk to leaders and entrepreneurs about their biggest business failures. We'll deep dive into how they overcame these setbacks, the lessons they learned from them, all to help you gain valuable insights. Failure is an essential part of the business journey, as well as being the key to success. So we're here to show you how to thrive from it. Matt Saunders is a coach and author with 15 years experience in digital marketing. Having founded a digital marketing agency previously, he now runs a community podcast and YouTube channel for freelancers and creatives to support them to get better results. In our conversation today, we talk about Matt's humble upbringing and how this influenced his approach to entrepreneurship and gave him a scarcity mindset which held him and his business ventures back for many years. We also discuss the fallout from a demanding client relationship which went sour and the impacts this had on him personally. Matt offers lots of practical advice and resources and shares his journey very openly, honestly and vulnerably. I think you're going to enjoy this one. So this is Beyond the Fail with Matt Saunders. Matt, thank you for joining me today. Where did it all start for you in, in kind of business and um, having your own businesses? Yeah, wow, that could quite far back, actually. Um, I've always, I've, well, I'll put it this way. I've never wanted to really work for someone else. And I realized that very early on in my career. I finished uni in 2007 and I went and got a job as a web developer and I very quickly realized that working at the same desk with the same clients and the same commute day in, day out, nine till half five was, was not for me. And so I bounced around a few agencies around that time, but I ultimately went, well, I went freelancing. I love the freedom that that gave me. And, um, the the chance to kind of do my own thing was was really really appealing so what is it that kind of you know um put you off sort of working from uh, for others what what kind of it sounds like you got a bit repelled yeah that's a good way of putting it because there's a story that i sometimes share with people is i when i first went self employed i wasn't doing it i i wasn't moving towards anything i was only moving away I was moving away from mm. the commute, the job, the client, the boss, the team, even like I just wasn't loving it. And it was more like that forced my hand than, than, a, than an exciting entrepreneurship journey that came later. But in the first instance, it was a moving away from the situation that I was in, which I realized isn't, isn't the best start. And <laughs> it's something that I talk about with my clients mm. now. It's like, okay to to know what you don't want but we, we really need to get uh, get clear on what it is you do want so you can move towards that so it sounds like uh, you know sort of using your words at that point you didn't really know what you wanted no idea <laughs> uh, and why was that i no had no direction um you know i, I this is a, a fairly classic story but I, I grew up in a in a working class family in a working class town and there, there, there wasn't really such a thing as career aspirations. There was this idea of climbing the ladder, I guess, at whatever job you were in. But certainly there was nothing, there was no talk in the family of business ownership, entrepreneurship, doing your own thing. And so I really had no guidance or direction. And the university course that I was on was web design course. That was all about skill development. Um, they barely even talked about getting a job. Uh, let alone doing it for yourself. So, yeah, when you don't have the direction, it's hard to know where to go. So it sounds like you didn't have much sort of support or inspirational role models around you. No, none, none at all, really. And at this point in my life, I probably wasn't even really consciously aware of that. Like, I didn't read books. I didn't follow anybody in business. I was just kind of floating around knowing what I didn't really want, but had nothing to move towards and nobody to 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 say hey have you thought about doing this check this person out follow this idea you know no absolutely and and what did um your parents do um my mum 
pretty much was full time full time mum. Um, occasional bits of you know part time bar work, supermarket work, etc. And my dad um, is a bus driver. So what did they think about you going into self employment and having your own you know essentially forging your own path? Yeah, it's. Do you know what's funny? Um, it, we don't really talk about it. It's that it's so outside of their their field, if you like, their field of experience, consciousness. It's you know all they all they were or ever really bothered about was, are you doing okay? Are you doing okay for money? And I'm like, yeah, I'm doing all right. And then that's it. That's all they want to know. Am I okay? No real curiosity around what I'm doing. Um, just just the way that it is. I, I I became comfortable with that years ago. What do you think that um that kind of background? I mean, you mentioned you know your words, working class upbringing. What do you think that um kind of taught you? But I suppose secondly, what influences that had on the stories that you tell yourself? That's a good question. I think for a number of years, I had no concept of creating value in the world. And so I, I started out as a web design hobbyist, started trying to sell it to people. And I had no clue about the commercial value of it because it was just an art form for me. It's like a, a hobby, a form of expression. Um, and so I had no judgment on what it was to create value because I was always either employed, like I worked at HMV, I worked at McDonald's, um, my parents were employed, everyone in the family was employed or unemployed. <laughs> so there's story around like, hey, you can forge your own path. And part of that is product services and the money that you charge for them, you know, well over my head. So, so things went over your head, but does that mean that and you said that you didn't um, have a concept of creating value, but did that hold you back in any way? Um, it did, yeah, absolutely. Um, it held me back in the sense that I used to get very frustrated. So I would see people who I deemed to be not as capable as me um, in the design space, in the web development space, um, you know, selling their work that, you know, wasn't, that wasn't very good it, to my mind, you know, wasn't accessible, wasn't, you know, up to, up to scratch, um, selling at higher fees, no problem, you know, confidently going into networking events, confidently giving pitches and all this kind of stuff. I used to get really frustrated by that because I thought that actually you just needed to be really good at what you did and the customers would come knocking. And it's been a bitter pill to swallow over the years to learn that, it, that the opposite is is almost true. I mean, it's not that you're going to be bad at what you do. Obviously, you've got to be good at delivering. But the way you package it up and present it, that's where that that sort of charisma and entrepreneurial spark, if you like, that was completely missing from my from my mindset. Um, and so it really frustrated me when I saw other people seemingly do that naturally. What was missing then? Was it was it? Was it marketing? Was that what you? What, is that really what you you mean? Hmm. I wouldn't say it was marketing, although that is obviously the kind of manifestation of what was missing. But what was missing, I think, is the piece here. And I'm just tapping my head. Um, is the sort of, uh, yeah, I would say mindset, the mental vantage point of success. Like, what is it that I'm actually putting out there? And what is the commercial value of it? How does it help to make something, how does it help to drive positive change into someone else's business? If you get that, and if you understand that, and you can have that high level conversation, you can sell anything. But if you don't understand that, you can't have the conversation and selling it becomes a lot trickier. You become a commodity in the in the eyes of the buyer. And that's the place that I was for much of my career, I think, a, a commodity. And I think that was probably birthed out of this, I guess, working class identity of being a cog in a machine. Uh, you know, working at McDonald's, you're literally trained the ABC of how to do things. And it's great. It's a great system. But um, there's no scope for imagination there. 
Yeah, and that's obviously the point, isn't it? It's uh, it's you know, I mean, it eventually will be replaced by robots, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so, w- what sort of success did you see, or did you see success in that first foray into creating your own path and and having your own business? How did that first business go? I would say the first the first instance was not successful in the sense that um, I didn't really make a lot of money and I don't think I learned anything either. Like I just went back, I went and got a job. Um, it wasn't until later on. How long did it last for then? Uh, how long did it last? Let me think. It was only a couple of years, I think. Maybe 18 months um, doing bits of contracting, finding my own sort of piecemeal clients. Um yeah, I, and uh, yeah, and I wouldn't say I came out of that experience knowing what I didn't know before. I still didn't know what I <laughs> what I didn't know before. Um, the learning all came later on. That's interesting, isn't it? Because often, you know, and obviously that's a key topic of conversation on this podcast is that when things don't work, people, you know, even if they've lost money, for example, they still value those experiences because they learned something. So I think it's a. Cu- I'm curious just to know why you think you didn't learn anything from that experience, or is that, you know, is that actually true? Did you did you learn something? And yeah, maybe you're thinking you didn't learn something. I think the lessons came in hindsight. In my reflective, you know, I've done a lot of coaching. Um, I'm trained as a coach. Uh, I've developed my self awareness over the years. I think that for much of my younger years going into my 20s I didn't have a lot of self-awareness and without self-awareness how can you you can't really see what's going on can you so I think I was just in it and it all started to hit the fan and I ended up getting a job and not really reflecting on it you know I didn't have these tools of oh maybe you could journal down your thoughts maybe you could speak to a therapist or a coach do you know what I mean it's it's just wasn't available to my consciousness at that time and you said things hit the fan what what happened how did it kind of did it all come crashing down yeah i just i just lost i just lost interest in it really because and and this goes back to what i said earlier the interest wasn't there to begin with not fully there wasn't a full throated interest in going self-employed or building anything so there was no there was no fuel in the fire so with the little spark that was there at the start, if there was one, kind of petered out very quickly. Um, and then I went back into getting a job. So after that, when I came out of that, that things started to really ramp up in a more positive way. And was there any implications of you, you know, you um, leaving that first kind of business or, or setup? No, not really. It was, I mean, I was a sole trader, so there was no company to shut down. Mm. There wasn't exactly a lot of money hanging around. Um, mm. I think I had a couple of clients that I, I can't even remember how they went, actually. It probably just, like I said, it probably just petered out just through lack of activity, really. It wasn't a, it wasn't what you might call a business. It was more of a foray into, mm. I guess, mm. self-employment, freelancing, very, yeah. very casual. Um, yeah, had his moments of enjoyment, but... You know, I remember one time I went into the city center and went to this um, cafe that was on the ninth floor of a building or something and just looked over the city center and had my laptop with me. Just things like that. These little moments of freedom were really nice. But yeah, that that's that's really the only positive that come to mind from that from that experience, unfortunately. So how long did it take you to then go back into entrepreneurship and self-employment? Yeah, how long did it take... Probably about four years, which is interesting because obviously you said at the beginning you know you had the you were repelled from working to for others, and then obviously spent longer working for others than you did for yourself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I think as I was growing up a bit, I found enjoyment in some of the agency work that I was doing now. Interestingly, if you look at my C- CV, I bounced around quite a lot between those two stints of mm. self-employment in that four-year period. I think mm. I was at one, mm. two, 
three, yeah, three different agencies at that time. So that's mm-hmm. not a long amount of time in any particular space. So you can kind of see where this is going. Like the the restlessness and the itchy feet has always been there. Is that because you were searching for your purpose and searching for something to give you that excitement and and uh, and spark in that fire, as you said? Yeah, I think so. It's th- for me. There's only so much that you can get from a team or a project or anything when it's a job i've always wanted to do my own thing like since i was a kid i would i've always been creative you know making clay model animation doing making games on the computer when i was a teenager and stuff like this i've always been really creative and that's just found like entrepreneurship has just been the perfect vehicle for that and yes i could be creative in my jobs but it's still contained it's, and it's still limited in the sense of I have to work with these clients on these projects. I have to be at this place at this time, and actually, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not in control of this ship. You know, it's not my thing. So, all that combined, I was never gonna, <laughs> I was never gonna stay in any role for, you know, a measurable amount of time. Yeah, no, definitely. So obviously, you came back into entrepreneurship. What? What moment um, did you start to get traction in one of your, um, you know, businesses and actually see some success? Yeah, I'm going to skip ahead a few years to um, 2018 when I launched my own web development agency and I niched into working with small charities. So before that, I just designed and built websites for anyone who would pay me. And I kind of realized like, I've got to get more focused here. If I want to have a marketing message that lands, if I want a consistently deliverable product, um, if I want to make an impact, like a proper impact on the lives of my clients, I've got to focus on a community. And so I chose these small charities and that was transformational from every perspective. My mindset massively um, improved. My income tripled. The number of clients I worked with went up. The quality of service was noticeably higher. Um, it was just, yeah, it was a great, great experience. And you used um, an interesting kind of, uh, I suppose, concept of around community. Why did you feel that a community was necessary for you to build a business around? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I talk about this a lot with my own clients who aren't sure if they want to niche down or what market they want to serve. And I always try and move the language away from away from niching and away from like market verticals and things like that and move it more to this idea of client community because I think a community is what you serve. And if you're in the service industry, like the clue's in the name, you know, so many of us seem to have forgotten that we are there to serve. It is a service. It's not just something that they buy. It's a mindset that you carry into that relationship. And I think it's so important to understand that if you're going to build goodwill amongst that constituency of clients and if you're going to make an impact in their world, um, seeing it through those eyes makes all the difference. Uh, definitely. And it, it sprang to mind the, um, I don't know if you've read, it's a fairly famous article, I would say, in terms of marketing and um probably startup world um uh, it's called a thousand true fans by kevin kelly um made famous i think by um by tim ferris because he talks about it a lot on his podcast um but that is talks about the i suppose it's particularly for creative industries um that you know you only need a thousand people in your community to buy your product to you know earn a and a kind of decent um, you know, living and and start you know start a business, and I think because obviously that that makes it seem achievable as well. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Like with the charity sector, there's like a hundred thousand charities in the UK, uh, mm-hmm. which is more that like it's an underserved sector anyway, um, and mm. a lot of the big players attract most of the donations and volunteers. So let's try and level that out a bit with a, a you know a compelling service to them which is what I delivered. And what attracted you to, you know, 
doing web de development for charities rather than doing web development for, I don't know, pharmaceutical companies or something. Yeah, I think just around that time, there was quite a lot of stuff happening politically, a lot of change in the country and abroad. And I was just getting quite activated by a lot of that stuff. But also there was um, an event actually in Leeds called um, Leeds Soup, which basically um, this group of people put on a, a night where people from local charities would come and present their ideas. And what you would do in the audience, you would go and you, you, would, you would buy some soup, get a roll with it, get a drink. You contribute 10, 20 pounds, something like that. The pot of money that was um, available that night then goes to kind of like the winning, like what the audience votes for as the winning pitch, so to speak. So you get charities, you know, homeless charities that are um, looking to, uh, you know, sort of build a new space for their service users, for example. And that's what they're going to use that money for. Um, and I just found all this stuff, like, it just seemed to cut through all the crap that I'd dealt with in the commercial world previously. Um, like a, a lot of the clients that I'd had to work with in jobs that I was in before, I didn't really gel with, you know, and this was a really nice, refreshing way of, mm. you know, going into a different space. And set the scene for us, like how, you know, you, you talked about this, you know, you having some success in this business. What was it looking like in terms of, you know, did you have an office? Did you have staff? What, what you know, how, what did it look like? So this was in, uh, by the time it really hit its stride, it was 2020. So I was working at home. Um, and it, that was kind of good, actually, because the restrictions in place at that time kind of kept me focused. But, you know, it kept me out of the pub. <laughs> but also, mm. like, the charity sector in particular they could no longer work in their communities, no boots on the ground. So they were looking for ways of improving their digital assets, if you like. So I, it was kind of like right time, right place for me. Um, and yeah, in that year, I think I did my first 100K year at that point, which was, oh, that maybe that was 2021, I'm not sure. But that that it was all building up. And um, yeah, I started working with a brand designer, a copywriter. I hired a web developer to come in and develop some of the websites under me using my processes. And that was uh, that was amazing because I found I could get onto sales calls knowing that current projects were actually being built as I was on those calls, which was a whole new thing for me. You know, it was all just me selling my time, working alone. Now, all of a sudden, project delivery is happening and I'm not doing it. And that was scary, but very exciting. Why do you think it took you that long to essentially have a team around you that enables you to focus on one thing rather than you being the front end deliverer, the business owner, the, doing the sale, the sales and everything else? Because it goes back to that upbringing, doesn't it, of being the grafter, the one who's just selling their time and doing it all themselves. But it got to a point where I'd been doing personal development for a few years, reading books about business, and it all seemed to point towards this idea of delegation and scale. And it also got to the point where I was looking at my to-do list and I was like, I'm taking on more that I can actually deliver. So it, it makes sense to start outsourcing some of this stuff, but also I'm in a place now where I can increase quality, you know? I could say if a client needed a rebrand, for example, or at least a brand refresh, I work with someone and we can deliver this. Like it's going gonna, it's gonna to produce better results for you. You know, I, and copywriting, I used to let clients write their own content. Big, big, big mistake because it would take them forever and it would be terrible. And so it wouldn't be effective. And so I, you know, brought, brought this service into what I was doing um, and it just made total sense. It was just that mindset shift towards higher level thinking. Yeah, thinking like a, you know, a business owner more than a... Yeah, like a problem solver, yeah. Well, an employee. Mm. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And I, know, and I know that, you know, speaking offline to you, um, one of the stories you, you kind of wanted to share was around when you, you know, you had um, dealings with a client, um, which turned out to be kind of quite problematic. Um, and you kind of 
it sounds like you you kind of took on kind of too much and i'm just you know that seems a relevant kind of segue here to talk about because um you know we're talking about delegation boundaries your boundaries yourself as a business owner and obviously if you're trying to do everything you're not really putting up the right boundaries because um and obviously you know you can't do everything and you're basically holding yourself back do you want to share that story yeah i can do so this was actually back in time and i'm jumping around a little bit but this was before the charity web design thing this was back in 2016 i had i took on a client um and it was it was misaligned really from from the start you know you get that gut feeling but you someone's dangling some money in front of you so you just go for it anyway um and that kind of carried on um they were a company that seemed to want us to do everything and do it totally with creative freedom but also wanted to micromanage every single decision they sacked their marketing manager halfway through the project and didn't even tell us and they also asked us to do paid ads as part of the project which wasn't a service that we offered and it wasn't something that i um had any experience in now at the time that didn't go well right this doesn't this is not a happy ending story um but at the time i was very blameful of them and i was just like they shouldn't have asked for that and you know i was playing the blame game and i was very in victim mindset but looking back and the lesson that i learned from that actually was you know you've got to take responsibility for the decisions that you make and if those decisions include compromising your boundaries not knowing what you're actually offering and operating from a place of fear i if you don't say yes to this client they will sack you then you're not going to you're not going to do very well so that was a real big turning point for me a realization that i've got to get clear on what it is that i do and and part of this actually informed moving into that third sector working with charities business because that mm. that enabled me to put boundaries around the lines around what i was delivering and who i was delivering it for and and mm. what the components of that looked like and what they didn't look like much more empowered position to be than the guy i was two years previous who was just saying yes to all kinds of stuff and getting into all kinds of trouble interesting and that um well firstly what what was it that you were meant to be delivering for that client uh, it was just a website project yeah just a website design and nothing special um this was before i started integrating copywriting and things like that so that was with the client and as i said the marketing manager disappeared halfway through so they were responsible for that and all of a sudden that came crashing down so you could see how it was starting to implode <laughs> mm, yeah no no uh, and obviously it's imploding from their side as well by the sounds of things and you were absolutely you were caught in the middle yeah. of it in some ways and you used the word fear what were you fearful of oh this has been an ever-present sense in my life um it, it you know, it's this idea of if you say no, they could they could decide to go to a different service provider. If you say no, it risks confrontation. If you so, in a way, it was easier to say yes and then try and figure out how to do it later than to be clear on what you want. And you know, if you if you know anything about psychology and the way that the human mind works, the 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 base of fear is is death death of the body <laughs> is uh this idea that if if i'm sacked if the client sacks me then that means i'm not providing value and if i'm not providing value then i'm not making money and then name words going to get out and if i'm not making money then i have no value and etc 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 can't afford to pay my bills can't afford to eat that's where the that's where you mentally spiral to if you don't have the awareness and the courage to face that thinking and change it up were you conscious of that of that fear and that um catastrophizing that you've just talked about i don't think that i was no so is that something that you can kind of learn in hindsight yeah the, the first book that i read on personal development was in 2018 when i set up the the business to work with charities 
because I had a vision for that business and I knew it involved getting out of my comfort zone. I knew it involved creating videos, going on podcasts, public speaking, those kinds of things. And I read Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. It was one of these books that I'd kind of heard about for years, but just thought, yeah, not, not for me. And then when I read it, it just all kinds of little sort of mindset shifts were happening and these realizations and, and light bulbs in my mind. And I was like, wow, this is, this is like it's been written for me. You know, little did I know that it, it was written in the 80s and has sold hundreds of that, well, millions of copies. Um, and it's such a common, it's like fear is such a common thing in society. Um, but I wasn't really even conscious of that, which is just bizarre when I look back because I'm so reflective of all this stuff now. And, you know, my, I've worked on my self-awareness for the past seven, six or seven years. And I'm just like, wow, you know, totally different person. Mm. It's quite ironic, I thought, that you were like, oh. There's no way I would get into that situation today. Mm. But it, I thought it was quite ironic that you were like, oh, that book doesn't sound like it's for me. And it was all about fear. And that was probably the fear that was holding you back from reading that book. <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably, because a lot of it comes down to identity as well, doesn't it? And I'm like, I'm not the kind of person who who um, who reads books like that. Yes, and that's an interesting point because you've that's the second time you mentioned identity today, and I, I think you you talked about having feeling that you had an identity. I think you said as a commodity, and, and that's linked to this fear as well, right? Or well, I suppose. Let me ask. How do you think those two things are linked together? Well, if we look at um, we look at what a commodity is, which is a price-based service, if you like, or transaction, not value-based. If you don't see yourself as someone who's driving value, then you're automatically a commodity. And to see yourself as someone who creates value requires bigger picture thinking. And that requires courage. And if you're in a state of fear where you're worried about being judged, you're worried about putting yourself out there, you're worried about creating something new, you're not going to create something new and therefore you're going to stay in this commoditized place and be in this vicious circle of fear and commodification. Yeah. Again, was that something that you were kind of conscious of? Because you, you know, you've talked about a feeling of being like a, a, a cog in the machine and having an identity around this working class kind of background, um, the sort of mindset of being an employee. And I think that all of that seems to be uh, playing its part in this fear, which is, which kind of held you back and, you know, gave you this scarcity mindset does that kind of resonate yeah it does absolutely and it's interesting because i think what you, you you talk about awareness and consciousness i think i was becoming aware and becoming conscious of this as i moved through different agencies and different you know met different people in my industry who may not have been from the same background of me as me who may have come from slightly more affluent backgrounds and had a different mindset, a different view about money, a different viewpoint about their their role and their place in the world. Um, and I think that was definitely influential. Meeting people that are from those different backgrounds um, is so important. It's not necessarily going to be obvious straight away what's, what you're seeing or what you're feeling, but it will change you over time. And then in hindsight, you look back and you go, that person there or that situation there actually changed my perspective for the better and what was the impacts of that fallout with that client um well i was i was questioning my career choices to be honest with you because this was nearly 10 years in at this point and it was kind of like all coming to a head all of the things that you fear are, are going to happen on a client project that don't generally tend to happen seems to happen you know it took nearly 10 years for it to happen um, we, you know, I remember I went to meet them and I had no idea how, what they, I had, this is it. I had no idea how badly the project was going from their perspective. And it was a proper roasting, you know, and I came out of that meeting feeling like just utterly shameful. Um, and yeah, I had to take some step back 
some steps back for probably a couple of weeks. Um, was looking at different career options. Uh, it wasn't just this this situation, by the way. I think it was a culmination of things in the run up to it. Um, but yeah, it it was a. Uh, I'm thankful for it, and I'm thankful for all those experiences because, you know, when you go through those kinds of difficulties, it it. it I mean, it's the cliche, isn't it? But it makes you stronger because you you look and you think, hang on, what you know, what can we do here? Because this can't go on. So it sounds like it. You took it quite personally, but it sounds things. It kind of hit you hard. Yeah, massively. Yeah, massively. Both my mum and dad, emotional people, and you know, there's no, there was no idea of this separation of business and work. Sorry, business and uh, and and yourself, or this separation of what what you offer as as a service and who you are as a person. You know, in my mind, they were the same thing, pretty much. Especially coming from a hobbyist background, right, where it's an artistic. It's like an artist's perspective. You know, you are your work. It's an expression of you. So if someone criticizes that or the way that you run your business, it's very easy to take it personally. Um, and I probably did, yeah. And what did those few, you know, few weeks look like? Because um, it sounds like it kind of took over your, your life at the time and affected you quite kind of deeply. And, you know, as you said, you were questioning your career choices at, at that time. How kind of low did that go? Well, I remember I was reading, um, what was it? I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was this article about how long it takes to retrain, how long it takes to, um, you know, or how to find a more aligned career path. Um, you know, it was one of those moments where I didn't even want to improve what I was doing or change what I was doing. I wanted to get rid of it entirely. It was a very much a moment of retreat, I think. Similar to what you said earlier, you were repelled when you, your first job. And that seems to be a bit of a theme here that any kind of negative experience in that part of your career, you seem to go into retreat defensive mode. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's still something I work on today. You know, I, I do a lot of, um, I put a lot of effort into getting clients that are aligned to what I want to build because I know that if there's misalignment I will struggle to deal with it so does that mean that you've kind of um managed to overcome some of that yeah that scarcity mindset and that fear of not you know not wanting to take on every client Absolutely. Yeah. I think these days, I mean, I've, there's still work to do because I think this personal development journey is, you know, it's it's limitless, really. You can just keep going and going and going. But I now see the world in a much more optimistic, positive and, and abundant light as well. Like I, I look at the market now and the opportunities and, you know, even in the space now where there's a lot of talk of AI cannibalizing the creative industries and all this sort of stuff, I'm just like, well, okay, that's cool. But where's where's the opportunity? Like there's always going to be, like everything is in expansion. So let's just see how we can ride the waves of that and create some new stuff from it and enjoy the process. It's a whole different perspective that I have these days. Yeah, no, no, absolutely sounds like it. But I suppose shifting back and, and keeping on the theme of, of, of mindset, offline we were talking about, um, you know, what you might focus on today and and i've written written it down because it was that kind of so sort of significant a quote you said you had a mindset in the state of failure what did you mean by that <laughs> yeah because i remember you asked for specifically what's the failure story and i was like well pretty much most most of my career <laughs> living in a state of low self-awareness low self-expectation low ambition um it was so, it's so strange. Like I think of this internet generation of which that I'm a part of, you know, when we, we all started to get connected in the early 2000s and I found myself in that space as a hobbyist. Had it not been for that, I probably would be like working in a factory or something. And I'm not saying that in, in disrespectful terms, but I probably, I'm from Grimsby and I'm not from Leeds originally. Um, I'm from a, a small town on the East Coast and I, I, I don't know, but... I, I suspect that without this miraculous opportunity that I just kind of found in my in my teens, I probably would still 
I would have probably just followed the family trajectory, you know? Um, but being catapulted into that commercial, in, incredibly commercial space that was really, really up and coming in the 2000s, being catapulted into that, but carrying the upbringing, the mindset of someone who isn't in that world, it's a weird, it's a weird space to be in. It's a weird dichotomy. And I, and that's why I call it like a state of failure because I'm in a space where there's tons of opportunity and lots of entrepreneurial stuff happening, but I just don't see it because I wasn't brought up with that way of thinking. And so I think for the first five or 10 years, you could probably characterize that as, yeah, like failure because there was no ambition. Like I wasn't working towards anything. You know, I've heard, I've heard success defined as intentionally working towards a specific goal. I wasn't doing that. I was bouncing around all over the place. And that lack of ambition, how do you think that it held you held you back and how did it kind of manifest? Oh, yeah, it held me back loads. Um, like financially, I never really, didn't really have any savings, didn't start a pension until I was 30. Um, uh got frustrated quite easily, didn't see opportunities. Um, spent a lot of time distracting myself with, you know, going to pubs and things like that, drinking and just sort of dossing about. <laughs> I'm not painting a very good picture of myself in here. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of like the business, how, how do you think it held you back in terms of like your businesses and, and entrepreneurial ventures? I think that there are so many things that I held myself back from doing. So I remember years and years ago, about 10 years ago, someone asked me to give a presentation on, I'd written a blog post about something that was quite novel in the industry at the time and it got quite a lot of traction and that was great. Very comfortable for me to write a blog post. Someone asked me to give a talk on it and I just said, no, straight away. Absolutely not. Mm. Didn't even, there was no, not even a negotiation because I wasn't the kind of person who did those things. Um, but who's who knows, you know, if I'd have started speaking in public 10 years ago, that could have transformed where I'm at today. And it's interesting, it's back to that identity piece, because you just said, I'm not the person who gives public speeches. Absolutely, yeah. I remember saying to this person, I've got nothing nothing of interest to say. Mm. And that's the sort of low, and you, and you, know, you said the words low self-worth and low self-esteem earlier, that's linked to that as well, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think an interesting um, question as well is, you know, you said, um, you know, you were kind of bouncing around and didn't really have uh, kind of those those kind of clear um, goals. And I was just sort of thinking, what do you think held you back more? Was it the fact that you had this mindset and low self-esteem um, you know what we've just been talking about or do you think the fact that you didn't have a clear purpose and something that you were trying to aim for yeah which one held you back more and is there a link between the two I think there's a link yeah because with awareness you can start to see potential things to do which might be linked to a purpose Um, yeah I would say that you need a purpose like if you're self-employed, if you're building a business, there needs to be a reason for, you know, a reason beyond just yourself, in in my opinion. Um, like a lot of people start businesses because, or go self-employed because they want more freedom, etc. But that business has to stand for something and you have to stand for something. And that means knowing yourself. And if you don't know yourself and you don't know what you stand for, what you stand against, etc., then you're not going to have that brand. You're not going to have that purpose. There's going to be no mission there. There's going to be no mission alignment with the people that you work with and the projects that you take on. And so you just fly by the seat of your pants the whole time and it's hit and miss whether you actually enjoy your work or get results for people, right? So a slow process of realization of all this for me. What do you think um, have been the impacts to you personally from from you being held back so much or you holding yourself back so much and you know you're in your words having a sort of first half of your career being a failure 
what personal impacts has there has there been? Yeah, I mean the the opportunity to create some kind of wealth, whether it, that's through you know investments or whatever it is. Um, but I guess also like. Yeah, I would say having the confidence to bring on partners, delegate out stuff that I am not hugely skilled in or um, don't want to do and having the confidence to say no to the wrong kinds of things as well. Um, you know, I feel a lot more empowered now to take control of what it is that I'm up to. Whereas before I felt like the the world was running me kind of thing you know i had to just say yes to things um which yeah that's personally that can put you in a state of stress because you know everyone likes to feel like they're in control and if you don't feel like you're in control then you can feel pretty anxious and stressed um and i think i probably spent a lot of time in those states and where do you think you might be now if you'd if you hadn't had that fear and uh, and that mindset uh, at the first half of your career? It's a good question. I think probably the direction that I'm headed in now is of more people, more money, bigger impact. I know I've been pretty vague with that, but that's probably, that's probably where I would be now because that's the trajectory mm. that I'm on. Mm. Just accelerated it. And everything you've mm. just described is that abundance mindset, right? I, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, it's just that it's just that deep sense of knowing that it'll be okay. Yeah, I think this is a, a really uh, you know interesting topic, and I know this will resonate with a lot of people that um, you know listen because what we're talking about here is is essentially, I think, what a lot of small businesses owners, entrepreneurs suffer with is they get in their own way and therefore they you know and I've had a, I've had a guest on before talking about this that they essentially don't build a business they essentially create a job for themselves because they are scared of you know taking on staff trusting people taking on the cost so essentially they just they're they, they they think they have a business, but all they have is actually a job that they're doing for, for others. They're kind of, um, you know, not a de facto, a de facto employee or de facto job, but with their name on the door. Mm. So I think, um, yeah, I think that's, you know, a, a really, you know, th this this conversation is, is very re relatable to those people. Um, what advice would you give them? Given everything that you've kind of learned and where you are, what advice would you give to those those entrepreneurs that are in that situation? Yeah, my my first piece of advice for so much stuff like this is to start before you are ready. So, so many times people say to me, oh, I will do this thing when this condition is true. And the problem is for that condition to become true, you need to do the thing. So hire someone or invest in something or take out the loan or just launch the product, even though it's a, a minimum viable product, you know, um, whatever it is that's going to trigger some growth, not, not necessarily for the business, by the way, this, this is the thing, like what you want to do is put yourself under some stress and pressure, positive pressure to build the mindset, which will then filter up into the business. You know, you might not see immediate results, but that's the point of this. That's the point of taking an investor's mindset, you know, invest and lose potentially in the short term for longer term gain. That's the, that's the rule of the, that's the rules of the game. And, um, so that, that's always my advice to people, you know, that, that are in the words that you used getting in their own way. Cause that's what they're doing. It's like, they know deep down what they, what would move the needle for them. But they're getting in their own way by letting the, the fear just pile in. And have you got any advice that helped you along the way? Yeah, I mean, really, yeah. So one of the books that really helped me was Start With Why by Simon Sinek, because that helps you to instill some purpose into your business. 
Mm. It helps you get clarity on what the model could look like and what it is that you're building. And when you do that, you can start to almost visualize what the structure of the people and roles within your business might look like. And so you can then say, okay, well, I'm doing all these things right now, but I plan to bring somebody in here to fulfill this, these roles, you know, and, and then, then move on that. Like, don't hang about, um, you know, like I spotted an opportunity to bring in a developer and it was great. It made total sense to do that. I could have just, could have saved money by not doing that, but it, it, it freed me up to, like I said earlier, go on those sales calls. And, um, you know, also there's, there's kind of like a, you know, going back to that identity thing, there's a little nod to yourself that says, I'm someone who's got some help here. I'm someone who's paying someone for their expertise and their time. Like, that's what I'm doing. And then you can say to your clients, I've got a team. You can say that authentically. I'll get my developer on the case, you know? And these little, these are little nods to your own identity and mindset that just give you that feeling that, Hey, all of a sudden you are someone who do who does these things. No, great advice. I and I always recommend it, so I will recommend it again. I, I always recommend the E Myth. Um, because that is an excellent book. Mm. Talking a little um uh, talking about what we we've been um evaluating today, which is around, you know, are you creating a business or are you creating another job for yourself? One thing that um one thing that um that struck me was um at what point did because it sounds like you know you've had a everything we've been talking about today is around mindset and that mindset um shift that you've made and you know the before time when you said you're in a state of failure and then after that what was the pivotal moment that changed everything that shifted your mindset i mean there are two uh, do you know what there are too many small things to 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 talk about i don't think there was one pivotal moment um I, one of the big things as i said earlier was the idea of i've got i've got this vision for the business now and i am not big enough to fulfill this vision and so what do I need to do and who do I need to become to fulfill that mission and that vision? And that is someone who, like I wrote a book called The Digital Charity, 35,000 words. Um, that got me clients. I went and spoke at some events that got me clients, ran webinars. The guy before that, two years prior, would never have done any of that stuff because he didn't have a vision for where he wanted his business to be. So uh, yeah, actually, there probably is a pivotal moment, and that's it. <laughs> but I was how this topic will resonate with lots of people out there, and how they're probably thinking, you know, because everything we're talking about is mindset, and obviously that's a that's a quite a complex um, thing for them to overcome and to make that change. So I'm thinking, it, like, what what made you change your mindset? and what shifted it quite significantly because that's what they need to do so essentially maybe the question should be <laughs> what advice would you give them for shifting their mindset yeah i think going back to what i said a moment ago tr trying to develop a vision for what you want to build knowing that that's a po knowing that that's a choice is or a possibility is really powerful because if you it's like giving yourself a a point a and a point b i think a lot of people are at point a but then they're just kind of floating towards an undefined point and so if you can give yourself a goal that's gonna i mean if you give yourself a goal then you can start to see what the steps look like towards that goal and those steps might be big and scary but at least you can see them and then you've got some reason to start taking those steps otherwise you're kind of stepping in all directions and going nowhere <laughs> yeah yeah no definitely yeah i think i think you're right that 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 purpose question is um is so important um and i often think that people don't you know i was talking to someone last week who ran a business 
and they were looking to invest um in property and i was asking them why they wanted to invest in property and the reasons they wanted to invest in property were all around like freedom financial security and i said but why can't you get those from your business um and i think that there was a a sort of uh again back to the kind of mindset of that they weren't clear about what they actually wanted that business to to give them um so i think mm -hmm. getting clear on getting clear on what you want firstly i think is the most important thing like what do you actually want your life to look like and then build your business around it and then find the purpose for the business and then align the two things is is so, so crucial yeah. so just kind of come wrapping up what advice would you give to listeners who might have experienced a you know significant challenge or, or setback in in their business i would say sit with the discomfort that arises talk to someone uh an impartial trained ear someone who isn't just going to tell you that everything's okay and that you know like a family member or someone like that um journal down your thoughts like write it down speak it aloud record yourself talking on your phone and don't don't be held back by all that sort of stuff like worried what people might think or if it feels a bit silly it doesn't matter talking therapy effectively to yourself um and then yeah look for the lessons look for the lessons that um can inform the next step and and just just ask ask how this thing came about how you can avoid it how you can improve how you can grow um and and what you really want you know because most things that happen are a result of our own actions you know it ma makes no it's it's not worth playing the blame game and being the victim even if you have been wronged you might as well look for the lessons um and and move from that space would be my advice no, excellent so final question if you could go back in time and not have had that failure in your first half of your career and that never happened would you take it I mean, yes, like it, it, I could, because I can't imagine what things would be like without that. Um, and even though I said to you that there weren't really any lessons to be learned, like I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure there are somewhere. I'm sure that it would have taken me to where I went and to where I am now. So yeah, I don't really do regrets. So yeah, I would, I wouldn't change it. Mm. Great. So we always end on a quick fire round. So this is um, short questions and short answers. Question one, failure is? Failure is, uh, failure is success. <laughs> What's your life's mission? Well, I want to help people that are experiencing the kind of stuff that I went through 10 years ago. What's one piece of advice that you'd want to give to other people on your deathbed? Do the things that scare you. Nice. Name one habit that keeps you resilient. The gym. If you could be immortal and live forever, would you take it? No. Why is that? Well, we're talking about that point A and point B, I feel like we're all going somewhere <laughs> if we weren't. And I don't know what I would do with myself. If you could swap places with another business person in the world, who would it be? Do you know what? I've always liked the work of, I mentioned Simon Sinek earlier. I feel like a lot of his stuff is just on point. Um, and, it, you know, he gets to speak on stages about the stuff that he really cares about. And it seems like he's making a pretty big impact in a meaningful way. So I think it'll probably be him. Great. Who could you recommend that I think I should have on as a guest? What, anyone in the world? Or someone that you, you know, that they've got a good story and that, you know, you know maybe in your circles or that you know of. Hmm. 
there's a guy I've been working with for a while actually called John who we're, we're quite aligned in, 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 in some of the experiences that we've had. It would probably be like doing the same sort of interview with me actually, but he's got an interesting story and he's tried some really interesting stuff that has failed. Um, I'd be happy to actually put you in touch with him because um, his story is pretty interesting. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. So Matt, where can people find you and connect with you? You can find me on LinkedIn, just search Matt Saunders. I'm pretty active on there. Um, it's my primary social platform. Or just go to mattsaunders.uk. There's all the information on there and what I do and links to social media as well. Perfect. I'll put that in the show notes. So Matt, thanks so much for um, being here and for your time and really enjoyed the conversation. And I know a lot of people are going to get some value from it. So thank you very much. Nice one. Cheers, Jez. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Fail. Really hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. Please do subscribe to the show and leave us a review. It really does help us to grow and to reach more people. Do follow us on social media too. We're at Jeswood on Instagram and at Beyond the Fail on YouTube and also on Linktree. Thanks again and see you soon.